Welcome everyone, I'm Stephen Crane with uh, The Armed Gamer, um, and with me right now is Nick, uh, I don't want to butcher <laughs> your last name, so I'll let you pronounce Nevote. it. Pardon? Nevote. Nevote, Nick Nevote. Yep. Um, and you're a uh, developer for the new uh, MMO RTS that you guys are working on, uh, Novus Eterno, correct? Yes, that is true. Okay, so why don't you, uh, you know, tell us a little bit first about yourself and about uh, your company, uh, Telltale... Tatali. Tatali, okay. Yeah, we're just all about the crazy names that no one can pronounce. <laughs> I mean, no, we've done, uh, it's it's hilarious even just watching us remember how the hell to pronounce our own studio name. <laughs> <laughs> so, pretty much uh, about four years ago, I was playing competitive strategy games, StarCraft, Dawn of War, and uh, I was really enjoying it, but I wanted a bit more to my strategy experience. I wanted a RTS game with a lot more um, empire building, empire management, diplomacy, infrastructure, politics. But I didn't want to give up that micro-intensive RTS action and combat. And I also wanted it in a massive universe where I could play with all my friends. So what I wanted was a true MMO RTS. So as just a normal gamer who likes strategy games, I went out looking for this ideal game that I wanted to play and uh, just to see if I could find it and start playing it with all my friends. And I could not find anything that kind of was what I was hungering for. So after a little while of looking, I started to contact other people online, try and put together a group of developers just to go ahead and try and make this game that, that, we, were, that we wanted to play so much. And it, it was more just kind of why not. I mean, uh, we're from the Internet. We got this kind of thing. Um, we knew absolutely nothing about development when we first started, but we just kind of we learned along the way, and uh, the project just kind of grew a lot and turned into such a, a a team collaborative passion between all us developers. Okay, and I know that as uh, in indie studio, it's often very hard to get funding. How are you guys kind of uh, able to? keep your heads above water right now? Are you using like Kickstarter or? No, we actually went for purely uh, angel investors, so a lot of friends and family financing and stuff like that, and we don't eat very much. <laughs> Good to know. Uh, and you guys are up in Boston right now. You obviously just visited uh, PAX East. How was that for you? How was the crowd reception to your game? Unbelievable. I, we We were... We still are a bit in shell shock. I remember one um, Saturday night at about 6 p.m. we had a panel just where we were going to talk about the game, the studio, and show a little bit of in-game footage of it. And we were walking down the, the hallway to where all the theaters were, and there was this massive line that stretched all the way down the hallway and into the main lobby of PAX. And uh, our enforcer, the guy who was helping us out at our booth and stuff, like, knocked me on the shoulder, like, teasing, like, yeah, that's the line to your panel. So we all burst out laughing and stuff, and then we get to the front of the line and ask, well, what's the line for? And they said, it's for you. And we were really shocked. I mean, uh, we were not expecting, we filled the entire theater, and it was uh, definitely not expected. And the, the, throughout the whole time our booth was packed, I mean, you can still tell I'm my voice is just starting to recover from all the <laughs> interviews and all the talk. It was, it was unbelievable to see so many people wanting this same kind of game that we made. As I said, I mean, we made it as gamers just wanting to play this game. Um, and it's nice to see that there's so many people out there that also want to play this same kind of game. Yeah, and you know what I find really interesting is that the MMORTS is a genre that's never been successful yet. Yeah. You know, so how are... Have you guys like played any of uh, what w used to be an MMORTS before they collapsed, or you know how how are you guys kind of differenti differentiating yourselves from those failed experiments? Oh yeah, we we've all played quite a few of them, and even kind of the, the modern ones that are trying to come out now. The main the main difference is that we went at it from a different angle. We went at it from the perspective of an RTS gamer wanting an MMO experience instead of trying to create the genre of MMO RTS and try to figure out what that is. So we wanted to build that MMO game with all the action, the strategy, the micromanagement of an RTS game 
and with the MLL element added, but again, from a gamer's perspective. So what a gamer sees as an RTS is empire building, base management, unit management, and combat micromanagement. That's kind of what we see as an RTS. And then what we see as an MMO is hundreds of thousands of players on one seamless, massive map. And so we try to kind of make what we as gamers would consider to be a good, true MMORTS while not losing any of those RTS elements that we all love. Okay, now, getting into the mechanics of the game, how is progression going to be handled? Like, are, are there going to be, like, RPG style, you know, you can train this to get this bonus to your units, or is it going to be a pure RTS experience in a giant universe? The best way to explain it is the infrastructure and empire building is very similar to an RPG leveling up system. I mean, it, it takes a while to capture more planets and to expand in that area to build up a really strong economy and infrastructure. But the combat and ship movement and ship production is much more attuned to a typical RTS. So you can pump out fleet after fleet go blowing the crap out of everything, losing all your units, and pumping them right out again. So you maintain that real good action of a normal RTS game instead of going more on the MMO route where it would take you weeks to build up a fleet. Okay, and how is uh, how are things going to be handled when we're offline? Uh, I think I read somewhere you're going to be using AI. Yeah. How we deal with, I mean, that, that's, that was honestly one of the biggest issues with making a true MMORTS, is that what do you do when the players are offline? And that was, I mean, there is no perfect solution, but the solution we came up with, which we find works quite well, is that when you go offline, you set some base priorities for your AI. So what planets would you like it to protect the most, stuff like that. Then after you've been offline for more than 15 minutes, any ship that you lose gets replaced for free, so no cost to you. So, just as a base example, if I go and try and take one of your planets, your fleets will go and defend that using the AI. Now, it is an AI in RTS game, so it is not going to be as good as a player no matter what. So I will probably destroy that fleet, but it will be reproduced very quickly for no expense to you and come back out there. So it almost adds in a different element to the gameplay. Why, trying to capture a planet from an offline player is like a first you have to beat through their fleet possibly two to three times to get to inside their empire and to their planet and then you have to hold off the enemy fleet while you're trying to drop your forces onto the planet to start capturing it and the longer the the defender has owned a planet the strong the more dug in they're going to be so if i'm trying to take a planet that you've had for weeks it's probably to take me quite a few hours of holding off your fleet continuing to respawn and attack again while i'm trying to capture it and let's say you come on then the next day you still have all your resources all your credits and all your military forces but you've lost one planet. But you're in a perfect position now to go and retake it and get revenge on the guy who took it from you. So we're not, we're accepting the fact that when you come back online, it's very possible you will have lost a planet or two, but you're all set up to be able to take that back and go gain revenge on it. It's not a major catastrophic event that's happening. It's not like you come back online and your entire empire is gone. Okay, awesome. And what... How are you guys going to handle it if someone does lose all of their planets? Like, is it going to be they have to restart, recreate an account, or how does that going to go about? You can't actually lose all of your planets. Uh, sorry, food just arrived. <laughs> Understandable. Um, okay, so um, the the way it works actually, you have what we call fortress shields which you can construct up to two or three of them, and they're a massive shield that covers your planet, any moons around that planet, and a little bit of space around that in addition. You start with one of these on your home world. No enemy unit can get through this fortress shield or shoot into it or anything. They take a long time to construct, though, and you have a maximum number of them, so it's not like you can run into an enemy empire, capture one planet, and build one on it instantly. You need to hold that planet for like a week to build a fortress shield. And if you can hold a planet in the middle of an enemy empire for a week to successfully build a fortress shield, you know, you deserve it there. 
Nice. Now, one, one thing I, I've also noticed is you guys are uh, talking a lot about players being able to kind of build alliances with each other. Yeah. Um, how is that going to be handled? Is it going to be almost similar to, like, EVE Online Alliance uh, sovereignty uh, issues, or how... What we wanted to do is, because it is a a, a true MMORTS and a, a real diplomatic environment, we wanted to be able to almost create a volatile situation where anything could happen very, very quickly. So you can create small alliances of up to 15 players, which are very, very tight-knit, lots of benefits and restrictions between you and your allies, but other than that, there is no diplomacy that we put onto the players. So if you can create verbal agreements with four or five other alliances that let's make peace, let's not attack each other, but in one instance, someone could break that agreement. There, there is no, we don't force you to say, okay, you cannot shoot at another alliance if you have a peace treaty with them. It's all, all the diplomacy is really up to the players. Okay, awesome. And uh, so d does that mean you guys are kind of going to be very hands-off in how players interact with each other and allow griefers to kind of come in? And Well, the one thing is because it is a persistent world as a single universe griefers have a base they can't just log out and vanish so griefers would make a hell of a lot of enemies and they would now be under attack quite often because well they've pissed off a lot of people and it it'll it makes people think a bit more about diplomacy if if i'm really rude to you i'm a griefer i just go just to troll you as i want to well now I've just made an enemy and to get revenge on me you'd probably try and search out find where my base is and just keep on attacking me, obliterating me, and making lots of problems for me. It's not like I can just log off and then vanish, and it's, it's no cost to me. Mm -hmm. Every time I make an enemy, that's one more enemy in a persistent universe that I can't run away from. Okay. Awesome. And how is the in-game economy going to work? Is it, are you going to be able to trade resources and units, or is every, you know, every player kind of going to be existing more in a vacuum? No, there is trading of resources, trading of components for ships, because all the ships the players design themselves, they, we give them a, a long list of basic hulls, and then they put the weapons, the engines, the shields, cargo bays, onto those hulls to be whatever they want to. And you will be able to trade all those components. You'll also be able to craft those components in a very unique crafting system where it kind of works similar to like the Diablo 2 Herodric Cube, except for it's random per player. So a formula that works for me won't work for you. You'll have to just test things out and see what works, which adds a lot of value to good crafters. If I've figured out a formula that adds plus 5% DPS to a cannon, I can't just tell you that formula. I can't just post it on Google. You can't just search on Google for the best formulas. You... Now, I have a component that I can produce that has a whole lot of value that very, very few other people can produce. Okay, interesting. Uh, so, does that mean that players will kind of be able to take on different roles and, like, one person is going to be there to mostly build components, someone's going to be there to harvest the resources to sell, and, you know, or is it going to be everyone is kind of in that role of attack and defense with... Well, this really goes into the whole dime philosophy. Uh, one, of the one of the developers is a retired U.S. Air Force Major General. I believe he's actually the highest ranking military advisor in entertainment history. Don't quote me on that, but I'm fairly <laughs> sure of it. And um, well, he, used, he teaches at the U.S. War Colleges, and that's our food. Um, uh, and what he... One of the, his favorite philosophies that he taught was DIME, which stands for Diplomacy, Information, Military Economy. Those four are the pillars that build up a successful empire in a volatile situation. And those are the four elements that players must always keep in mind in the game. Now, I'm not saying that a player must do that all in himself, but if you want to go 100% militaristic, then your economy, your diplomacy, and your information will be lacking, and you will need to find someone else who can help make up those elements. And that's actually the real key point of the 15-man alliance, is that everyone's skills will all complement each other. So sure, you'll have a couple players that are just in it purely for the RTS combat, the ship micromanagement stuff, and then you'll have some more economic players, more crafting players, more espionage and diplomatic-oriented players, and within that alliance, you will complement all of each other, 
and create a really strong unified empire. That's kind of the whole key behind it. Okay, and you know, uh, one question that I know is always a challenge for a good MMORTS is going to be, what are you guys going to be doing with the new players? Is there, you know, is it going to be everything starts core and kind of builds out with new players slowly at the rim of the universe, or is it, you know, new players can spawn in next to a really uh, older player who has more resources? Well, we're doing two things with new players. We, first of all, the, the, the later you join into the universe, the more spread out you do, the, the further the edges you do put. So you're always around people who join the same time as you. But more importantly, what we've done is that there is no difference between a, a brand new player and a really, really veteran player when it comes to your military force. You have what we call command points, which is effectively a, a really advanced population cap system. So a brand new player can have the exact same military force, the exact same fleet power as a really veteran player. What the veteran player gets is a lot higher technologies, better ship hauls, better weapons, but they cost more population cap. So a really veteran player could have a much smaller fleet that are a lot better, whereas a new player could have a huge fleet that they're all pretty, like, just stuck together and scrappy. Okay, awesome. And I also saw you guys are considering PvE events. Are those going to be, like, instanced uh, storyline progression in the game, or how are you guys going to be handling uh, PvE? Well, at the moment, the game's real focus is PvP. It's... And for many reasons, for the competitive reasons, for the actual RTS gameplay reasons, and for the diplomacy. We want to keep it really PvP-based. There is PvE um, factions. Uh, I'm not allowed to talk about too many of them, but for example, there is a human scavenger-ish piratey faction. Um, and, but, so you'll, you'll have them raiding your empires and just all around exploring around space. But the main key to the way we're doing a lot of the PvP and storyline based quests, if you will call it that, is that we're actually trying to organize the players in it to make it not totally a PvE quest. Okay, for example, there will be two different factions that both put out a quest to do a different thing that relates to each other. For example, the pirate faction may put out a quest to raid a convoy, and a different faction puts out a quest to help escort a convoy. So it turns into what would normally be a PvE quest where you're just going and following orders, but instead of that, it's you and a hundred other players trying to raid this convoy with support of the pirate faction versus another hundred players trying to defend this convoy with support of that other faction. Okay, awesome. And I, I also just want to take the time to encourage anyone who's watching, post questions in the side if you have them. Um... You know, I'm going to keep asking my own, obviously, but if you have any questions, ask them, and I can read them off. Um, someone wants to know, uh, how can a veteran player progress after building a successful empire? What do the players gain from PvPing at a veteran level? Well, there is no cap. You can't reach level 80. Your empire can be as big as you want to. You can capture billions and billions of stars, but because of your military unit cap, the larger your empire is, the harder it is to expand it more, the harder it is to capture more planets because your, your defensive lines get kind of thinned out as you go. <coughs> Excuse me about that. So that's the main thing. There's always room to expand. And on top of that, I mean, we'll be doing continued development on the game, constantly a always adding in new ship hulls, new technologies, new capital ships to unlock. So there is no real end to the game. Your empire can always be bigger. You can always be better entrenched where you are. You can always have better political relations and you can always have a stronger economy. There is no real limit. Well, oh, okay, well now I have a, a good economy now. It's over because at that same time, if someone goes and attacks you and you need to all of a sudden start pumping out massive war fleets that can drain your economy in an instant. And I also noticed you guys have um, a ra uh, pretty deep race uh, structure going on, it looks like. Uh, is there also going to be a class structure, and how, how are those going to be set up? Well, uh, the way that we structure the races and, and the different capital ships, which in a, sec in a sense are kind of like your classes, it's very open-ended. So you don't... 
okay, a quick example. Humans are incredibly micro-intensive and hard to use. I mean, they're, they're not they're not a noob-friendly fleet for someone who isn't good at RTS games. Uh, one of the alien races, the Varanus, that we just uh, announced at, pa at this PAX, they are very... A lot easier to use. I mean, uh, the, the directional armor on their ships is quite mo is a lot more balanced, whereas the humans have really, really strong front armor. If you hit them from the rear, you can be popping their super dreadnoughts just really easily. Um, so you have those major differentiations on a very basic level, um, and then you have different capital ships which have different skills, different primary weapons. Um, but the main real difference is that you can. You can expand in whatever area you want to. If you want to be a defensive player or what would be considered a tank in a normal RPG game, just design your ships to have better armor and better shields and not focus so much and not put so much energy into other things. It's really just up to you of how you want to play the game. If you want to be an economic player, well then just put more of your playing hours into building up your infrastructure, your economy, and your trade routes instead of your military forces. Okay, awesome. And you guys have um, something called the Infiltrator Program coming up soon in about three weeks. Why don't you explain a little bit more about that? Uh, well, because we are such a small studio, we can't afford the luxury that a lot of studios, a lot of major studios have, of hiring on uh, quality assurance companies and focus groups to do the final polishing of the game. Instead, it seemed like because we're a group of strategy gamers, building a strategy game for other strategy gamers, it's only logical that we actually bring even more strategy gamers into the quality assurance and the balancing and the gameplay improvement process. So what the Infiltrator team is, is that we're inviting our fans and our community into the game to help us improve the game. Now at the beginning you'd be helping us like find bugs, testing the gameplay and balancing, and the more you help us out, the more we want to actually hear out all your ideas on the game. Because, I mean, this game was designed by... I mean, every gamer knows. When you're playing a game and you get that idea in your head, oh, this game would be perfect if we just had this one other feature. That's how this game was designed. It was just full of those moments where us developers had those ideas. But we want to also hear those ideas from our community and get them into the whole development process just to help us make this as good a game as we physically can. Now... I, one, one thing that I'm kind of curious about, actually, is uh, how is resource collection going to be handled in the game? Is it going to be uh, nodes of resources on the planet, similar to what you would find in a Blizzard-style RTS? Or is it going to be more like home front or command and conquer, where you build something that can kind of generate its own income, and you you know, keep building up different structures instead of having to find a specific area to build one? It's more along the command and conquer end, it's ever different planets have different uh, levels of resources. So you may find one planet that has a lot of uranium. And so when you build your mines on that planet, you would be collecting more uranium in proportion to other, other minerals and other elements. But the real key, well, the, the real baseline of all the resources is that it takes construction slots on a planet to extract the resources from that planet and you have a limited amount of space on your planets so you can't you have to really prioritize what you want your planets to do because you can't afford to have lots of shipyards and spaceports and factories to be able to pump out fleets really quickly and have a whole bunch of mines there's just not going to be enough room on them so it's it's really up to the player of how you want to prioritize that little space that you have per planet okay uh... the watcher uh, kelsey wants to know have you ever worked at? Have any of you ever worked at larger studios before? How does working at a small slash indie studio compare? More freedoms or more limitations? Uh, ma about half of us have worked at major studios before and on major game titles, and uh, the other half were just totally new. Um, the real thing, I mean, the the thing that I keep on hearing over and over again is that it's it's you're more part of the creative process. For example, if you are working at Blizzard and you're a programmer, you're just one of the programmers on a massive team. Your personal opinions about the game, your ideas, there's a whole process where you have to submit your idea, you have to go through all the legal departments to get your idea approved, you have to do all these things, and then at the end, you probably won't even put in the game because the game design document is already done. Whereas in this scenario, I mean, we come up 
I think yesterday, actually, we just came up with a really cool new feature to add to the game that we all really liked, and, well, that's it. I mean, we, we just come up with it, we see if it can be done, how we would like to do it, and then, well, it's on the feature list. And what's been kind of the biggest challenge for you guys as, as you've been designing this? Like, is there... Have you guys been having more troubles with story, with any particular element that you've been trying to put in? Um... Uh, honestly, okay, it, it sounds kind of strange. Soon we're doing an MMO RTS where, I mean, hundreds of billions of dollars have been put into trying to make server architectures that could manage this, all this stuff. And the hardest part for us, really, I'd have to say, would be designing the human fleet. <laughs> it, it, we have redesigned the human fleet about 16 times over the past four years because they're humans and it's really hard to portray humanity the alien fleets are actually a lot easier to do because well they don't have to look human mm -hmm. but uh... honestly i'd have to say that's probably been the hardest part is just the art direction for the human ships interesting yeah. so like, w what's kind of been the most rewarding thing for you guys and is it the community reaction is actually seeing a product come out um... I would have to say us playing the game. I mean, that's the most rewarding thing. I, I enjoy actually being able to sit down and play my game and beat the crap out of my friends. <laughs> awesome. Now, uh, do you guys have a, like, a projected date for when you'll be exiting beta and actually coming out with the finished product? Um, it's not really solid yet, but it's hard to even put it into those terms because even once it's at a full launch it's not like well there's the game it's done we're gonna go do something else now there's still it's probably to be about six seven years until we've finished everything that we want to put in this game and by then we'll still have a lot more so it's just a date when we decide okay you know it's good enough to release now and it has enough features in it and we release and we still keep on adding more things into it over time okay and how are you guys I uh going to be selling this? Is it going to be subscription-based, microtransaction, a combination of both? Um, it, it's neither, actually. Just to be complicated, we feel like being different. <laughs> um, it is a one-time fee. You buy the game, you have the game forever, because subscription is honestly just unfair to the players, I believe. It's, I don't know, as a gamer, if I buy something, I want to own it. Mm-hmm. When I, 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 I bought StarCraft, and I can go back and play it anytime I want to over the past 12 years. Uh, that's just how I think it's a lot more fair. And free-to-play turns into pay-to-win a lot of the time. And also, because the server expenses per player per month are very, very high in this game, it's very hard for us to be able to support the free-to-play model. Mm -hmm. um, so what we have is you have the one-time purchase, you buy the game, you have it forever, and then we'll have a cash shop in the game, which is pay to skin, not pay to win. So you, you can only buy ship skins and stuff like that in the cash shop, that is it. No gameplay elements, nothing, just pretty colors. Nice, so, so essentially just basic palette changes. Yeah, uh, basic palette changes, okay, maybe you can buy like a pirate ship skin that has like spikes and skulls and stuff on it, on your ship, but it's still, it's, it's very basic graphical reskins for your ship, or for your avatar himself, nothing more. Okay, uh, the watcher Kelsey wants to know, uh, what would you guys consider your uh, targeted audience? Would it be experienced gamers, a gamer of a specific genre, or just everyone? Um, anyone who ever saw themselves as a galactic overlord controlling many, many planets and dealing with all the intricacies of running a awesome galactic empire, anyone, when they hear that, they're like, ooh, I want to do that, that's our target audience. Nice. And uh, Jay Purge wants to know, uh, what's the funniest reaction you guys have ever gotten when you've uh, told someone what you're working on? Um, well, there's always the, seriously? <laughs> There's that one a lot, but the best one probably has to be from, I don't know, I, my best one personally is my family. When I talk to them, they're like, oh, that's cool, look, you made a little game, and you're at like these little gaming conventions with other little gamers, but when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> that, that's probably the best one, N at least for me personally. Nice. Uh, Hellcat wants to know, as a student of game design, I'm wondering how big is the team of developers working on this game? How can I donate to the development of Novus Eterno? We are, what, we're 12 guys, a U.S. Air Force Major General, and a bunny. A bunny? 
A bunny. Did you bring the bunny to PAX? No, we did not bring the bunny to PAX. The bunny doesn't like to travel. I'm disappointed. The bunny, the, the bunny may be coming to next PAX, though, actually. We, we were discussing it, and, and the, the bunny may be ready to travel. <laughs> nice. Um, and they also wanted to know, like, how can they donate to the development, or I guess help the development, I suppose, if you aren't taking cash? Um, at the moment, we're not taking cash, just because that's really complicated. <laughs> trying to sort out all those systems, we're still trying to get our account system all working and stuff. But um, mm -hmm. the game will be available for pre-order uh, sometime. I forgot when. I, I don't know. I'm I'm I just I made games. <laughs> awesome. Uh, when? I think it was like June or July. You'll have to like check on our website or one of our press releases or something. Um, and otherwise, that's the point of the infiltrator program. I mean. Right now, we need help. We need people to help donate their time and their knowledge as gamers just to help us out. I mean, we can't, we can't balance this. We can't do all this on our own. We need the help of our fans to be able to pull this off. <clears throat> Excuse me, to be able to pull this off. Nice. Um, now, what, what are you guys going to be pricing the game? At? Is it going to be a full sixty-dollar game, no, no, one-time no. fee, higher, lower? No, it's, it's a thirty-five-dollar one-time fee, and there will be a major discount for pre-orders also for people who helped us out in the infiltrator program we'll also get a like massive discount and like cool ship skins and stuff excellent uh he's like ooh, <laughs> i like that it's a cheap game yes um yeah, we, as i said i mean we are sure we're game developers and if we charge 60 dollars then we get to eat more but at the same time we're gamers and 60 dollars for a game is a lot i mean so 35 bucks, it's a nice entry fee, you have the game forever for that, and if you want to support the development more, if you want to spend more money in the game, you can buy awesome graphics from the Tash Shop. So, uh, have you guys even considered Kickstarter? Because actually, I really feel like this would be something a lot of people would love to go in for. Like we, actually, we actually have. The issue with it is Kickstarter only accepts U.S. companies, and we're not a U.S. company. Oh yeah, you guys are from Barcelona, Spain, correct? I personally live in I'm I'm Greek, but I live in Barcelona, Spain. We have two Canadians, someone from the UK, someone from Croatia, from Argentina, from Sweden. Who am I missing? Egypt, Uruguay, what else? Now that's really diverse. How did you all just kind of end up coming together then and finding each other? Like did you know each other from uh, the games you've played before? Did you find each other on forums? Did you go uh, to school together? No. Um, actually, the first time we ever met face to face was Last Pax. Oh wow! After we were working together for three years, and Last Pax was the first time we ever actually met face to face. But no, we met all different places. I mean, some of the artists we uh, like, we just found one of the paintings. Like, oh, that's really cool. Let's go and talk to him. See if he's interested. See if he likes the game idea. Uh, on game development forums, um, uh, tattling people on the street randomly, <laughs> almost stuff. So you ever just like run into someone in a busy street, like you? You're a developer now. Let's go. Yeah, it's like, just you. Yeah. <laughs> you are server programmer. It's like, wait, what? Yeah, just throw someone to a van, bring them back. Yeah, pretty much. Awesome. Uh, Hellcat wants to know how long did it take to get the team together? Three. I mean, this final team uh, took about two and a half, three years to get. And there's a the problem on the internet is that the um, you can't meet someone face to face. I mean, you meet someone face to face over a coffee, you can automatically judge quite quickly. Okay, this person is to be reliable. This person is really passionate. You can't find that stuff on forums as easily. Mm -hmm. So that was really that actually. That was that may even be harder than designing the the, the artwork for the human ships. Um, that was that was really hard to draw. Find a reliable team where everyone could work together well. But uh, so yeah, that that took us a good couple of years. Okay, awesome. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions? And is is there anything you would kind of like to uh, you know shout out or discuss uh, before um, we finish this? There's so many elements to this game, so many things that we could talk about. It it could literally go on forever. I mean, just uh, we were just actually 
before we got on this call, going through all the feature lists that we want to add in, all the things we want to do, and there is just pages and pages and pages of just four words, like adding in custom ammunitions and reloading in different methods. And so, yeah, it's there's so many things we could go over; it would never end. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, Kelsey wants to know mascot nationality. Mascot nationality is from Uruguay. The the bunny? It's from oh, Uruguay. the bunny. Okay. Nice. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's about it. Thank you so much for uh, calling in and talking about your game. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to remind everyone to check out the website. It's uh, www.novuseterno.com, correct? Yes. Yes, uh, check it out. Sign up for the Infiltrator program. Uh and yeah, let's. Uh, I wish you guys luck with your game. I really look forward to seeing what you come out with. Oh, cool! Thanks, I appreciate it. All right, have a good day. Oh, day you too. Cheers. See ya.